Well, uh, good evening and welcome to Little Hill Church and our Thursday Bible study. We're continuing in our series of uh, what is a Christian and looking at the different descriptions and terms that the God's Word uses to describe uh, if we are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, who we are uh, in him. Uh, so far we've looked at what the word Christian means and where it appears. Uh, we thought about the fact that Christians are disciples, followers uh, of the Lord Jesus. Uh, the fact that we become sons and heirs with Christ uh, in God the Father's family. Uh, that we have been like sheep, we've been saved from our wandering, we've been rescued and are now secure in the fold of the Lord Jesus. We are stewards, we've been saved to serve uh, the Lord and his people and we are soldiers enlisted in the army of Christ who has already won the victory through his death and resurrection. And what we've said so far is that whatever we think about ourselves uh, as Christians is what God's word says about us. He is a final authority. Uh, we belong to him. So what God's word says about you uh, is who you are and also what Christ says uh, about you personally. We've also said that uh, these expressions, these terms, these descriptions actually tell us more about uh, the one that we belong to. Uh, remember what Paul says to the Corinthians, you are not your own. Uh, you were bought at a price, uh, that great cost of the Son of God who gave himself for us. And who we are in him really points us more towards the glories of our Saviour. Uh, there's that lovely simple song that goes that now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. Uh, one of those many simple songs that just encapsulate uh, the profound truth of the testimony uh, that every true believer uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ is. And the fact that we belong to Christ, that makes us a witness to him. Uh, we are automatically uh, a witness, and we'll be looking at that uh, this evening. But it also tells us how we should be living to honour him, how we should be living uh, to witness uh, to our Lord Jesus. Uh, and again, that verse we've mentioned before that's so helpful in practical application of who we are uh, in our day-to-day -day living, Paul says in Philippians 3 and verse 16, this is the NIV rendering, which I think is really helpful. Uh, let us live up. Uh, in the ESV, it's hold true. Let us live up to what uh, we have already attained. Of course, what we've attained is in through Christ Jesus. Uh, by his grace and mercy, uh, we are now to live up to that, to work out our salvation in fear and trembling as God works in us to will and to act according to his good pleasure. So this is what I am in Christ, my Lord and Saviour. So therefore this uh, is how I should live. Well, let's uh, turn to God's word then, and then we'll pray, and then we'll start looking at uh, this title for this week, A Witness, A Witness. So please turn in God's word to uh, the book of Acts. And this is one of the summaries of uh, the Lord Jesus, parting words to his disciples before he ascended to return to the Father. Acts chapter 1 and uh, verse 8. Actually, we'll read from verse 6. Acts 1 and verse 6. So when they'd come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? But he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I now turn to Acts uh, chapter 10 and verse 34, and uh, we'll see something of that, uh, that in action. Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. This is Peter preaching the gospel to the Roman centurion Cornelius, a Gentile with his family and soldiers, uh, waiting to hear the word of God. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. 
As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and caused him to appear, not to all the people, but to us, who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in his name receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. And Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water from baptising these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Well, let's pray, shall we? Almighty God and glorious, loving Heavenly Father, we praise you and bless you for your living word. We thank you that it is your revelation about yourself, about what we are like, as you see us, Lord, as sinners who have fallen, but your great and glorious salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that as we come into your word this evening, you might teach us and encourage us. We might be trained in all righteousness, rebuked where need be, but Lord, uh, as you do day by day, by your grace, encourage us to live more uh, in the light of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray these things for his glory. Amen. Well, please come back to that verse in Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus' parting words. Uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. Now, before we look into the huge implications uh, of that amazing statement uh, from God the Son to the apostles and to us as well as part of God's uh, word, uh, we're obviously included in that uh, because of the places that he lists, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And here we are in 2020, we are before that last point because the gospel is still going out, isn't it, until the Lord Jesus returns. Let's just think about that word witness. It's a word that we see time and time again, particularly in the New Testament, uh, the Gospel of John, the Acts. Uh, it's the Greek word martus, and it literally means an observer or a spectator. Uh, somebody who has seen something who's had an experience of something personally and can testify personally to the truth of that. It has a particular legal context to do with bearing testimony to the truth. Uh, this is what I've seen and I've heard and it's reliable, it's trustworthy. Uh, I'm a testifier, a spectator, an observer of these things. Uh, in a court of law, what's known as primary evidence is somebody who has seen something for, for themselves with their own eyes or has experienced something and they can bear testimony to that. And uh, hopefully if somebody is bearing witness, then they're there for the truth. <laughs> they're not there to promote themselves. Uh, they may not want to be there, uh, but they've been brought into the court, not for personal reasons, uh, with no hidden agenda, but just simply to be a witness, a testifier uh, to the truth that hopefully the court can progress and justice based on truth uh, can be done. Now what's interesting in God's word is the use of that word Marta uh, to witness, to testify, uh, is a key 
to what the scriptures are all about. Uh, that's very much a theme as we look at this word uh, in scripture, how it applies to us. They're a key to God's word itself and what the scriptures uh, are all about. Look at how we see the word in the New Testament looking back into the Old Testament, uh, particularly from the lips of the Lord Jesus himself. Uh, he's engaging with the Pharisees, as he does many times, to bring them back to the word that they claim they know and are following. He says in John 5, 39, that you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness, Malta, that word again, about me. Uh, and then we've just read from uh, Peter's preaching to Cornelius. He says exactly the same thing, following on from the Lord Jesus. To him, Christ, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. It's especially significant with John the Baptist, who's the last in that line of Old Testament prophets pointing the way uh, to the Lord Jesus. And he is the one that can say, as he sees uh, the man Christ Jesus coming towards him, he gives that final great uh, testimony and witness of what he has seen with his own eyes. Behold the Lamb of God, he says, who takes away the sins of the world. And John, who wrote the account, says that John the Baptist bore witness uh, to Christ. He says, I've seen and I've borne witness that this is uh, the Son of God. And that's John the Baptist's witness uh, of the Lord Jesus. And then we see in the New Testament how these two things come together. The witness of the Old Testament, the, the prophets and the law, and the eyewitnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ the apostles and the Lord Jesus makes this link himself when he uh, talks to the disciples after he's come back from the dead in Luke 24 uh, and then he said to them these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of the Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And then Jesus promises the Holy Spirit, that power of boldness and proclamation to declare this truth to uh, those uh, around in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In John's Gospel, there are several references to witness and testimony. John himself, when he gives this account of standing at the cross, seeing Christ crucified, he says in John 19, 35, He who has seen it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows he's telling the truth, that you also may believe. There's John's agenda for writing. And then he summarises at the end of his gospel with these tremendous words. Uh, but these are written, I've written these things, he's saying, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He's saying, look, I've witnessed these things. I'm passing them on to you, uh, that you may witness the truth of Christ for yourself by believing on him and receiving that new life. Uh, that he gives. That's very significant for us as witnesses today, as we'll see uh, in a few minutes. But that wonderful verse is worth hanging on to because that's a, a, a summary of not just the gospel, but the scriptures themselves. These are written as we offer somebody a Bible, uh, that you might believe that it's all about the Lord Jesus and who he is, the Son of God, and that by believing, you too may have life uh, in his name. Now come back to Acts chapter 10, which we read a few minutes ago, and there we'll see all these things coming together. We'll see the testimony of the apostles, we see the reference back to the prophets, and we see the, the testimony of Christ, uh, who he is, and the Holy Spirit, as it were, authenticating that with the power of God uh, by saving souls. Um, Peter says that we are witnesses. Uh, he gives a little summary of the, uh, the life and work of the Lord Jesus. We are witnesses of these things. Uh, verse 41, we, are we were chosen by God. It wasn't just an accident 
uh, that we were there as sort of casual bystanders, but God shows us to be witnesses and to testify uh, to this truth. And then he reaches further back into the Old Testament. He says, by him, by Christ, all the prophets bear witness that forgiveness of sins come through his name. And then while he's still preaching these things, the power of God falls uh, on those uh, Gentiles. The Holy Spirit comes. Uh, they testify that sign using uh, different languages, tongues. It was the Holy Spirit's authenticating sign uh, that they were indeed saved and that they, they, the power of God had come to them. Uh, and uh, they then begin to witness themselves and testify and extol God uh, in, uh, in that way. See, what's happening here is it's like really exciting and wonderful, and that is that the word of God, which is God's own witness and testimony about himself, and especially his salvation to rescue sinners uh, through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, from the, apostle, the, the prophets and the apostles, uh, then being applied uh, by the Holy Spirit, uh, and that combination of, of testifying truth and the power of the Spirit to create witnesses. So the question for us now is, 2,000 years later, how come we can be witnesses? Why is a Christian called a witness? We haven't seen the Lord Jesus. Uh, we're not a prophet or an apostle. So how can I be a witness? Well, let's now think about uh, the Christian as a witness of Christ, a witness to Christ. When Jesus said uh, in Acts 1 verse 8, you will be my witnesses, who was he speaking to? Just uh, those band of men who were there and then the men and the women, the 120, who received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. You know, he lists these places, doesn't he? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the world. Now, what we read in Acts 10 is the, uh, the, the biblical record of the unfolding of that. Uh, first to Jews, then the Samaritans, and now to Gentiles. But of course, the, the actual eyewitnesses were, were running out, weren't they, uh, before that commission was fulfilled by how many thousand years until the Lord returns. What about Jesus' plan? Well, that generation of believers that followed the eyewitnesses, uh, people like Polycarp, who were brought up under John, they, uh, they hadn't seen Jesus for themselves. Uh, and yet, because their eyewitness... Uh, they also were saved. They became witnesses as well. They believed and were saved without seeing uh, the Lord Jesus personally. The writer of the Hebrews uh, is in a very similar category. Uh, he talks about the supremacy, the superiority uh, of Christ uh, above Moses and the prophets and the angels in the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. He talks about this great salvation. And then he says it was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested or confirmed to us by those who heard it. So it's quite clear the author to the Hebrews is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the author of the, the, the human writer, but he cannot be uh, an eyewitness because of what he says. So what's happening here is quite wonderful because as the eyewitnesses completed their witness, they were able to pass on to the non-eyewitnesses their testimony, either written or spoken, either preached or shared in some way. That truth, it was accompanied as a Holy Spirit directed by the Holy Spirit's power. And those who believe that witness by God's saving power, they also received a personal witness by the transforming truth of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. They were able to see Christ by faith. That's why the Lord Jesus said to, to, to Thomas, uh, more blessed are those who have seen, uh, who have not seen and yet believed. They're not eyewitnesses. And yet faith has enabled them to see by the power of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, by faith. Uh, John Stevens, when he was preaching once at Little Hill, he said that we are witnesses of the eyewitnesses. I like that expression because we have the witness in scripture of the eyewitnesses, particularly the apostles who preached and laid down that word and preached that word. And we're now part of that succession of person to person witnessing. We'll say more about that uh, in a few minutes. But this is how the good news of the new birth spreads by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus said that he will convict the world of sin uh, concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. We can't save a single person, but also it's a person to person work. This is how God uses believers as witnesses. As we live as Christians, as we preach and share and have conversations, as we give witness, uh, that is proclaiming from ourselves this saving truth of Christ. And the Holy Spirit uses that. He anoints that with power to share with others the truth of the gospel. So if you're a Christian, you can ask, how am I a witness? I heard the truth about Christ. And then the Holy Spirit testified to me of my need, my sinfulness. And that may have happened for a very long time. Perhaps like uh, Saul, you are fighting it and, and keying against it and saying, I don't need this mountain all over me. But the Holy Spirit was at work and you're convicted of your sin. And finally, you saw your need for the salvation of God, the, the righteousness of God that you need to make yourself uh, right with God and God's forgiveness and grace uh, in your life. And you believe that witness, you believe that truth about Christ, that external witness and then with the witness of the Holy Spirit, as you believed on him, that was applied to you. And you were born again uh, by the Spirit of God and given that gift of the Spirit as an internal witness that you are indeed a child of God, as we've been thinking about. This is the, the amazing mystery uh, of the work of God. But the point is this, is that you have personal experience of something that is both life changing and true. Is something that's from God, not a work of man, not a religion. It's the truth of Christ applied by the Spirit. So it's both very real and very powerful. You know, we perhaps talk about giving my testimony. Well, that always has two parts, doesn't it? We testify to who Jesus is, the truth of Christ, but also what he's done for me personally. It's that truth applied by transforming the person from a sinner to a saint from an unbeliever and a rebel to someone who loves the Lord Jesus with a, a living hope in the Saviour. And that's why a witness really is just a, a, a herald or a conveyor of that good news. We, we give nothing of ourselves <laughs> apart from the fact that we have this need of salvation and then the Saviour came and granted us uh, new life uh, through himself. We have that personal testimony. It's no wonder that we have this great treasure of Christ's transformation in our hearts, in these earthen vessels. Uh, when Paul is writing to the Corinthians, he, uh, he says this, uh, this is 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, for what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's what it means to be a witness. We have nothing of ourselves. We don't proclaim ourselves, but we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and that light that he has shone in our hearts. We might know him and share and share him. Now we do hear about other <laughs> religious groups who call themselves witnesses. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. And I think it's helpful just to look at why they use that word and the difference that it makes to be a real witness of the Lord Jesus. Uh, they quote from uh, Isaiah 43 and 44 different verses uh, about Jehovah being a witness to, to the Lord Jehovah. But the question we ask is, is it based on truth? It's not. It's based on their own distortion of the scriptures, particularly where it comes to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ being less than fully God. So really their theology is an antichrist. And of course, because there's no truth, there's no Holy Spirit uh, to illuminate. No truth and no spirit. There's no transformation. There's no new birth. There's no forgiveness of sins. All these things we're talking about haven't happened. There's no heart change. There's no removal of sin. And so really there's a, a greater bondage to Satan. It's a false Christ that's risen up alongside, and yet it's totally false. It's a man-made system. Now, you might know Jehovah's Witnesses who are, are nice people. They're very religious. Uh, they're very sincere. But sadly, what they believe is, is a, a, a heresy. 
uh, is total darkness uh, and they are not witnesses to uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well then let's secondly move on to uh, our second point. This is the final, uh, second and final one of two points. Uh, we said the Christian you are a witness of Christ. That is what you are. But <laughs> the question then is I feel so inadequate as a witness and often we say I, I'm, I wish I was better at this. I'm such a bad witness at testifying in my own life to uh, how great the Lord Jesus is and to direct people to him. So secondly then, how to be a witness worthy of Christ. How to be a witness worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. We feel we let our saviour down, don't we? And uh, sadly what happens then, we get very self-piteous, uh, kind of inverted pride comes in and we fall into the hands of the enemy. It's a time on a tactic to disable our witness, to make us feel I'm no good, I'm useless, I can't do anything. But what we've seen from God's word is if you are a Christian, if you're a child of God, then you already are a witness. You've got that personal experience of the saving truth of Christ. This is what you are. So the question now is, how can I live up to being that witness? How can I do that? I can't be like somebody else. It's got to be uh, me through the personality that God's given me. Yes, I'm being renewed and sanctified day by day, but how can I be that witness to promote my saviour uh, to the unsaved, that they too might come to believe and be saved themselves and become witnesses? Because God's word says, this is his way. It's his way to do it like this. It's person to person as we testify uh, to the Lord Jesus. Well, John the Baptist said a very helpful thing, which uh, we, we can apply to ourselves, which I think is the, is the answer to this. Uh, and that is this very simply, uh, that he, the Lord Jesus, must become greater and I must become less. He must become greater. I must become less. And what John did there was to define the, the spiritual battle, the struggle, uh, as day by day we lift up Christ in our own lives. We become more Christ-like and less self-centered, less self-consumed, less concerned what others think about us, but more concerned of what they think about our glorious Saviour, uh, who is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is gr the greatest, uh, but he must become greater in my life, in my witness. Just think for a minute back to that courtroom uh, analogy that we started with. This time there are two witnesses uh, to uh, some crime scene and one just an ordinary person from the street, doesn't want to be there, uh, but happened to witness this thing going on and can testify to uh, what they've seen and heard. But the other witness is a well-known TV celebrity, a personality, uh, who has an appearance to maintain uh, and now they're in court and of course they dress up they've got to keep that persona which they've got uh, from their celebrity lifestyle they can't just appear as uh, the man or the woman in the street uh, they've got to be there with all their kind of stuff that their people are familiar with and be that celebrity in the courtroom now if you were the judge uh, or on the uh, panel of jurists whose testimony do you think will be the most authentic who would be the most trustworthy? The one who wants to draw attention to themselves or the one who's simply there to convey what they've seen and heard? Well, there's a lesson there, isn't there? Because the less of self we are, the more of Jesus that we want to promote, the better witnesses that we'll be. And God has given us some very simple helps to do that, to know him better, to love him more and to honour his name. And here we come back to what we've already talked about uh, in our study, and that is the scriptures. Because in the scriptures, the reference to witness, that word witness, martyr, shows us what the scriptures are all about. That they are a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. So as we read the Bible, as we study the scriptures, what we're reading is a timeline of God's salvation plan. His salvation promises that we are meeting the Lord Jesus Christ in the scriptures. So as you're reading God's word, always ask yourself the question, what is this teaching me about either directly the person of Jesus or my need for more of the Lord Jesus? What does it show me about him in the word of God? Because it is all about him. He said so. 
The law, the prophets, Moses, all testifies to him. He said that. So you can ask that question and pray and expect the Holy Spirit as you pray sincerely to, to feed more upon his word uh, to give you an answer to that. You see, our daily witness of Christ in his word then helps us in our daily witness to Christ. Our daily witness of Christ in his word helps our daily witness to Christ. And of course, this is a work of the Holy Spirit through his word to promote Christ in us and all that we do. Paul encourages the Colossians with this amazing thing. He says, uh, to the saints, God has chosen to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery. And what is that mystery? It is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Well, how wonderful is that? This is the work of God, but we are involved in this. As we meditate on the word of God and pray and study and long to love and serve uh, Christ more. And if that intention is in our hearts, uh, then God will bless that and encourage us uh, in our witness as we seek opportunities to speak for our Saviour. And as we search the scriptures, we can also use the word of God in our witness. As we verse ourselves in the word of God, little things will come out of our little patterns of speech and, and we'll be able to quote certain verses that relate to the gospel and the person of the Lord Jesus. You know, Paul says, doesn't he, as he opens that book to the Romans, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed to talk about uh, the saving work of the person of the Lord Jesus, because it's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. See, he's put his faith and trust in that testimony, in that witness of the word of God. So he knows he can quote the word confidently that it's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe in that word. Now, in the days at the moment with the, uh, the, the coronavirus, we've been told, haven't we, to, to socially distance. Uh, because if we do that, if we prevent that person-to-person -person contact, uh, then it will stop the spread. And hopefully the disease uh, will not be as, eff as effective as it could be. But with the gospel, it's the opposite. Uh, in our witness, we mustn't engage with social distancing because the gospel spreads person to person as the Holy Spirit testifies about Christ. It's the power of God uh, in us, uh, but it spreads person to person through your testimony. And that can be through your words, your actions, your, your reactions, just how we are with people as believers. Uh, if we are in the scriptures, serving the Lord and, and, and worshiping him and thanking him, then something about Christ likeness will, will come out as well. That's why we're studying all these different aspects of being a Christian. What it means to, to be a disciple, a son, a steward, a sheep, a soldier. That's all part of our Christ likeness, part of our witness to him and our witness for him. Well, as we conclude, let me just give you a, a final encouragement. Uh, we've talked about the scriptures as a witness to God's truth and uh, particularly the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But also, if you're a Christian, you are becoming part of that story. You're becoming part of the great uh, cloud of witnesses. And you can see uh, where we're going as we conclude here. Who have gone before us, who have finished the race of faith. They have testified, they have witnessed to the saving and the keeping and the finishing power uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they too encourage us as we think of those who have gone before but they also uh, give us some very practical helps as we aim to live not for ourselves, uh, but for the Lord Jesus, that he might become greater and we might become less. So let's just turn, shall we, finally to uh, Hebrews 12. And uh, these are well-known verses, but we come back to them time and time again. They're so helpful, so encouraging. Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, 
so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You see, as we think of those who've gone before, who've completed the race, they direct our thoughts to the Lord Jesus Christ, who finished his race. He laid down his life. He entrusted his life to his heavenly Father. He proved the work that he came to do. So those who follow on after him can say, yes, he is worth it. As we prove the, the strength and the genuineness of our, of our faith in him, our faith might seem weak-minded. But at the end of the day, the Lord Jesus uh, is worth it, even to the point of personal loss, uh, giving up our own lives. You know, we thought about discipleship and uh, discipleship and witness are very much part of the same thing. A disciple witnesses to the one uh, that he or she has become uh, a follower of. We demonstrate his, his lordship over our lives, uh, but also our love for him, even the ultimate cost. This is why the Lord Jesus talked about taking up our cross and following him, that symbol of our own death. This is why Paul talks about being crucified uh, with Christ. We've got a very powerful example of this with the first martyr, uh, which is where we get that word from, a witness, even unto death. Uh, it was Stephen in Acts chapter 7. And uh, you know, as Stephen preaches to the Pharisees, he testifies more and more about Christ from the scriptures, from the Old Testament. He becomes more full of Christ, doesn't he? As their anger gets more and more intense. As he picks up stones, he sees a vision of Christ, which he describes Christ uh, in his glory. And then he finally sees him uh, with his own eyes. And uh, as he gives that final uh, witness uh, to uh, his saviour, because, of course, he knows, as we know, uh, that in Christ, death is not the end. It's not a hopeless sacrifice because we have faith in Christ who passed through death, who's risen from the dead, the first fruits uh, from the dead. He is the living hope that is worth dying for. He is that living hope that is worth you and me dying for. If our witness should cost us that, and of course, he would give us the grace and the strength, as he did Stephen, who probably wasn't expecting that at all. But he glorified Christ ultimately uh, by giving his life. So as we conclude, as we think about being a witness again, it points more to the one we witness to. And uh, may we know more of that Christ-likeness, that grace, that strength, that love, that desire to honour him in our life and our witness. Let us live up, Paul says, to what we have already attained in him and for his glory. Amen. Well, let's uh, pray, shall we, and ask God's help in these things. Lord, as uh, human beings, as men, who we feel such uh, failures, but Lord, we uh, thank you that you have placed this great treasure of the knowledge of the glory of yourself in the face of our wonderful Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God who is man, who came to be our Saviour. We thank you, Lord, that although we feel fragile earthen vessels, Lord, we pray that you would use us Lord, this is your way uh, to use uh, weak vessels such as us so that you might have all the glory that men uh, and women who are outside Christ might see the Lord Jesus Christ through our words, through our testimony, through our witness. We pray especially for your help in these days when opportunities seem much more limited and yet the circumstances of the time are much more acute and severe. Uh, so Lord, we would ask you again humbly and sovereignly that you might uh, use us in these days to point to the living hope that we have in our glorious and precious Saviour. In his name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Well, do join us uh, in a few moments, Little Hill, uh, via the Zoom uh, prayer time, and we trust that God will help us to bring our prayers uh, to him. But if you're just a visitor, then do join us again on Sunday at 10.30 uh, for our morning service, and then at about 7.15 uh, next Thursday. And may God bless you and keep you uh, in that time.